Hey all, today we're going to discover the main secret of strong players. Sadly, a lot of players do not understand this and therefore they get stuck in their rating level no matter how much they train, how hard they try. I'm Igor Smirnov from the Remote Chess Academy and it's my great pleasure to reveal this main secret of strong players to you today. Let's have a look at the first example. It's the game between Carlson and Nakamura, two of the great players. And let's jump right into this complicated position of the middle game. Currently it is black to play, but I would say it doesn't really matter. Just think about this position for a little bit. Imagine you're playing white. What would you think about here? What kind of a plan would you try to come up with? Most players would notice that the black's king is exposed. It has only one pawn which covers the king, and therefore a lot of players would start thinking about some ways to get to that king, like maybe go in rook to g5 somehow, and then bring your queen there, and then somehow deliver that checkmate on g7, something like this. Or maybe just uh, bring your rook to e1 and then go to the back rank mate or some sort of a back, make, back mate rank, something like this. But now let's see what actually happened in the real game. It was black to play, so Naka played rook to g6, attacking the bishop, and Pangnus moved the bishop all the way back to e3. That's already the first little bit of a southern thing. Instead of trying to somehow keep the pieces closer to the black's king, white just retreats his bishop back. Black plays queen c6, threatening, oops, threatening queen g2, checkmate, and here Carlson played knight d5, somewhat forcing an exchange because now black can grab that knight with the bishop, and it's pretty much forced, because otherwise the knight is ready to jump to e7, attacking all the heavy pieces of black. Which is, again, a little bit of a surprising moment. Why would Carlsen force an exchange of pieces if the black skin is exposed? Why not to try attacking it? All right, because, of course, white could have just prevented checkmate by playing something like g3 and continuing playing the middle game. But instead, he played knight to d5, forcing that exchange, then trading the queens, after just a couple moves like this, he traded the queens, turned the game into an endgame, and then after a couple more moves, black just resigned, which again is a thing that would simply surprise a lot of the beginner and even intermediate level players. Let me just jump to the final position, simply to illustrate the point. That's been the final position of this game, where Nakamura resigned. And uh, whenever I show these kind of games to the students, if they are beginner level students, they even wonder what the heck is going on. They can't understand why would a player resign if there is no checkmate and it's not coming in any near future. Moreover, it looks like the position is a little bit complicated. So why would one player just resign? And that's kind of one of the things that strong players do understand and beginner and intermediate level players, unfortunately, do not always realize fully. I would say it's not that they don't understand, but they just don't fully understand this thing. It's that the, in the vast majority of the cases, in the games of strong players, they do not win the game by checkmating opponent's king. They win the game by winning a pawn, just like White did in this game, and then by promoting his pawn. So in this case, Black resigned because he realized that sooner or later, White is going to push his past pawns forward and they're going to be promoted into a new queen. While in the current situation still pretty unclear how exactly white can do this, let's move on to the next example where it will be illustrated in a clearer manner. Here is another example, this time Magnus Carlsen playing white against Sergei Karekin. It is white to play, and a lot of players would assume that it's a totally drawish position, not too many material left on the board, and yet let's see how Carlsen proceeded here. First he played bishop g7, using a fairly interesting tactics to save the h5 pawn, because black can't take it. In case black tries it, white's king goes forward, and all of a sudden the black's king is somewhat under the different checkmating threats. For example, rook a8 is a very straightforward threat. And in case black goes with the bishop back, there is also quite an unusual checkmating position here. White can proceed with rook goes to f7, and black has no way to stop the threat of rook to f8 checkmate. Quite an unusual and pretty tactics. Anyway, it did not happen in the actual game, that le therefore let me return to the actual game station. Karekin didn't fall into this trap. And after, Car 
uh, Carlson played uh, bishop to g7, Karekin simply returned his rook to c6. Now Carlson played pawn to h6. What's the purpose of this move? The purpose is to fix that pawn on h7, because white is going to go for that pawn in a few moves. Let's see exactly how Carlson did it. Karekin played king to f7, preparing possibly that check, rook c5, so Carlson returned his king there back, black played king e e8, and now can you find a way for white to go after that pawn on h7? It's fairly straightforward, he made that check, rook a8, and after king f7 he goes rook h8. And now black already has a hard time protecting that pawn, because king g6 would fail due to f5, check, and therefore black is you know, already in trouble. You may wonder, why would white need that pawn that much? Well, let me just show you a couple more moves and let's see what happened for after that. Now once black realized that there is no way to save the pawn, he just gave it away, Carlson took the pawn, gave a check back, and now he uses a simple tactic, rook stake f8, because after king takes, pawn to h7, and the pawn is going to be promoted, therefore Karakin resigned. You may notice how easily Carlson converted this seemingly equal position into a win. And that is, in general, the scenario of this game is very common. Over the last few months I've been working on a complete course about the secrets of strong players, and I've been analyzing lots of games of Carlsen, comparing it to the games of club-level players. And I've noticed that in the games of strong players, you will very rarely see when they go for the straightforward attack of an opponent's king, which leads to a checkmate. Much more often you will see the ending somewhat similar to the game that I'm showing to you right now, where one side wins a pawn, converts it into an endgame, and wins the game there by promoting a new queen. In the vast majority of the cases the opponent would resign, of course not waiting till the moment when you actually promote the new queen. And I would say that in the vast majority of the cases when you follow up a certain super tournament, the commentators somewhat mislead you, because from all the games played they would pick only those games which contain some beautiful combinations, beautiful tactics, and that would make false impression that that's the way these guys play, which is not the case. These are rather exceptional games. All right, let me show you a couple more examples of how it usually happens in the vast majority of the cases. Here Carlson plays against short, it is white to move, and you may give yourself a couple seconds to think about this position and how would you play here? What do you think about this? Obviously there are a couple of options that look equally good. At first you may think about the move like bishop to b6, attacking black, but it's not that much effective because after black exchanged the rooks, after something like rook takes d1, rook recaptures, and black can go knight d5, forcing the bishop to go back, and therefore we may say that this attempt rather failed. Anyway, let's take a move back and see what else can white do here. Instead of this, Carlson played knight c4. And once again, when players observe the games of Carlson, sometimes they even have a hard time figuring out what's going on there and what is he even doing. The knight was standing well in the central square, why would he move the knight backward? The reason being, he follows his favorite strategy, attack opponents weak pawns and also weak squares, because if you can see that this weak square on b6, the square which is not protected by other pieces of black or other pawns of black, it means that white can land his piece there and it will put strong pressure on opponent's position. Even more so, you can notice that the knight takes aim at that pawn on a5 and white is gonna increase the pressure in the future. Let's see what happens. And then, short traded the rooks, played knight to d5, Carlson played knight to b6, putting the knight on a weak square. Short traded here on e3, or traded with the rook to b8, and at this point Carlson realized that there is not much that black can do because he's somewhat paralyzed, therefore he just moved the king closer to the center. Now black has a hard time developing his light squared bishop, so he played pawn to e5, and Carlson immediately took advantage of the opportunity to attack opponent's pawns by playing rook to d5. Now both of the blacks pawns are under attack, therefore one of them will be captured inevitably. In the game he played bishop e6 and Carlson took the pawn on a5, and now that already gives him the very clear 
straightforward plan to win this game down the road. He has three pawns versus one pawn on the queen side, and therefore the white's plan would simply be to keep pushing his pawns forward gradually, of course, I don't mean to do this just in such a straightforward manner, of course you need to secure these squares so that pawns can move forward safely, but in general that is his plan, to move the pawns forward, create past pawn, promote it into a new queen, and boom, he's the winner. Let me just, you know, skip to the very final position of the game to show you what actually happened. So that's been the final position of the game. And Short just resigned. So White just played pawn to a7 and on the next move he's gonna promote it into a new queen. You can see how this game ended. If you want to see the entire game and all the games fully, um, you can download them by following the link below in the video description. And here is the final example of this lesson. The white player is Dink Leren, the Chinese top grandmaster, and the black player is still Magnus Carlsen. At this point, again, the position that would confuse a lot of the players, because the situation seemed to be imbalanced, with uh, like no clear plan for either side, and a lot of players would just be confused, they would be not sure what to do. But for Carlsen, it's never a question. He plays pawn to g4. What's the purpose of this move? As we already discussed earlier, the favorite strategy of strong players is to attack opponents' weak pawns, and before you can attack them, usually it's very good to fixate them. And that's exactly the purpose of the move pawn to g4. Black wants to make the, those pawns on h2 and g3 immobile, so that later on black can start attacking them. And it actually happened right after white played knight to a5, and black just played bishop c5, aiming to play bishop g1 on the next move, and all of a sudden you can see that the black's plan starts getting in shape. White played knight c4, black played bishop g1, white played knight e3, trying to counterattack black's pawn, but of course it can be protected easily. Carlson played bishop e6, white traded the pawns on g4, and all of a sudden white found himself in trouble. The only way to protect that pawn on h2 would be to bring the knight back to f1, which is a very passive position, and the black can just continue increasing his activity, bringing the king into the center and keep increasing the pressure. Otherwise, white has to give up the pawn, which would simply allow black to you know, win that pawn and again start pushing forward his past pawns on the king side. Carlson won this game fairly easily afterwards, Again, if you wish to check out the entire game, you can download it by following the link down below. And I hope that overall you could grasp this main idea, this main difference that a lot of the club level players do not understand. It is that even though the purpose of the chess game is to checkmate the opponent's kin, but that is rarely the winning strategy in the games of strong players. The favorite strategy of strong players is to go after opponent's pawns. And I have just shown you a couple of examples from the games of Magnus Carlsen. And I hope by now it's a lot clearer to you why is that Carlsen plays the moves that he plays. And of course it would apply to any other strong player just as well. Knowing this again will help you to find the right plan. Because oftentimes students tell me, well, I know how to play in an opening, but in a middle game, which plan to choose, how to play in an end game, I'm not sure. That's how you need to play. Go for opponent's weak pawns, fix them just like Carlson does it, and then go after them. In this lesson, I've shared with you the main secret of strong players. And as I mentioned earlier, I've been working on the course called The Secrets of Strong Players, where you can find the nine all of the secrets of strong players, the nine, which differentiates the strong players from the club level players. And knowing these nine things, you can clearly see the blueprint of what kind of things you need to change or slightly adjust in your play so that you can move yourself to that expert level. If you wish to check this out, you can again find the link down below in the description. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, give it a thumbs up. I appreciate your attention. Go crush your opponents and enjoy it.